The act of experiencing a game beta after years spent only with its final release can, in some ways, be considered an oddity. While remakes might offer updated or reimagined experiences, their foundation is always clear and rarely shifting. But it'd be misguided to say no such changes occur. Games are likely the most transparent medium in how tangible the results of their creative process can be. Films and the like can be subjected to rewrites, reshoots, or tests in animation and storyboards, but for cost-saving measures, never enter production till their base is finalized. By the time that first trailer rolls around, it's already on track towards a complete product. So while visuals or an actor might change, it's unsurprising that the content remains virtually the same. Only in rare cases like South Park trying to make topical and timely episodes based on assumptions that are later proven to be wrong will you see entire rewrites. But within film, even drastic overhauls like Zack Snyder's Justice League exist only for a fan movement seeking the release of a film cut that never existed beyond pre-production, thus creating what might as well be a remake. While only recent examples, if you think Romeo and Juliet were done in a single draft, you're sorely mistaken. But games are a medium so entrenched in consumerism that it's hard not to focus on how widely a game might vary from reveal to release, possibly looking like an entirely different product, which can be difficult to reconcile when it's those initial trailers and possible interviews that set initial levels of interest. In the minds of fans, and preservationists, that initial idea takes the form of lost media, and why when such build leaks occur, there is always cause for celebration. Players get to see what once was, but also in some ways, the reality of development itself. Operate under a large enough corporation, and even games or office politics outside the project can influence its trajectory. Plenty of media has been cancelled for similar, if not worse, reasons. But such decisions are perhaps more palpable in the dreaded executives meddling, setting features or design mandates to satisfy a board or at worst a single director. There's always some level of risk involved in such products in building or maintaining a brand's identity. While not uncommon for some games made for a specific series to branch off so drastically that they're reworked into an original IP, it's often the inverse that has the most tumultuous effects. Dinosaur Planet is just one of many games subject to executive meddling in its development, being transformed from original IP into the much maligned Star Fox Adventures. Look at its original beta and it's not hard to call it an oddity, not unlike staring into an alternate dimension. A sort of game's uncanny valley, dense in natural curiosity for what once was. So when its seemingly content complete build surfaced, it was a bit of a surreal moment for fans. While its narrative and mechanics remained familiar, its level design and structure were radically different in some spots, suggesting that in its shift to the GameCube, its development was not only rebooted but completely reimagined, limiting Crystal's part of the game to a mere prologue while dialing back on the more mystic narrative and adventure genre qualities. Perhaps that's why, without the content benefits of multiple playable characters, Fox's singular route became more padded in its contents. Were these just the results of a rushed conversion, want to better utilize the GameCube's hardware, or just a general refocusing on the Star Fox branding or some melding of all three or more? While that might explain why Andross's inclusion is so last minute and at odds with the core gameplay, until a developer speaks speaks out about its development, we're only left to the same position we were initially. Endless speculation over even its most minuscule elements and the possibilities within it. Which is the real heart of what makes beta so compelling for many. That mere question of why and what might have changed if things had gone as initially planned. Had Dinosaur Planet released in a more polished state, where might the IP be today? Would Rare still be with Nintendo or remain in Microsoft's hands, and would it have been successful on its own? Perhaps the security offered by an established brand was ultimately the project's saving grace if only financially. But while Adventures lost more than it gained in its rebrand from original IP to Star Fox, Metroid Prime benefited from that same shift, but with undeniably greater casualties in the cancellation of roughly three other projects, only Ravenblade of which would be seen publicly, but greater were the mass layoffs of those Nintendo deemed non-vital towards retro refocusing on Prime. It's cruel, but the results speak for themselves. Prime and its sequel Echoes remain some of the most acclaimed games in their genre, and Retro's future projects have shared similar fates, which makes it a no-brainer to hand off the fourth entry to the studio after Namco's original vision failed to satisfy executives. While equatable to poor foresight and early announcements made to satiate fans, work on a game long enough and it's easy to forget at one point you had to learn how to play it and construct it in a way that builds up and effectively challenges that knowledge. 
fail to make it flow well and you might spend countless iterations looking for a solution. That lack of fresh eyes is partially why Valve put so much stock in playtesting, so much so they're willing to restart development on even the most promising concepts if feedback is poor enough. But it's sobering in that it grants a more objective view of one's work and it wouldn't be the first time such receptions led to developmental restarts or even entire shifts in genre. While it's easy to hope of early iterations being released someday like a Yakuza 7 version from when it was still supposedly a 3D brawler instead of a JRPG, rather than sink the cost to satiate a few curious fans, a studio like Valve instead opts for transparency in their creative process. With its publicized removal from 2, Half-Life Lost Coast seems like the perfect example to tempt fans into unearthing or at least recreating it in such an easily moddable game. But what if I told you you could play it right now? In an unorthodox move, Valve made Lost Coast free to owners of Half-Life 2 on Steam. But upon play, one thing becomes abundantly clear. For its few highs and lows, Lost Coast ultimately serves no narrative purpose within the larger picture of 2, and nothing mechanically interesting that can't be done elsewhere occurs. It's filler, and considering the original length 2 was intended for, the removal of other levels starts making more sense. Quality and fun aside, if content drags down the larger experience, is its inclusion worth it? For a studio like Valve, that answers no. It's a harsh reality of game development, but a mentality that's pushed Valve's games into the realms of both technical marvels and cultural touchstones. Such information wouldn't be known were it not in part for Valve's own developer commentary, as it guides players through their own creative process in designing Lost Coast. And the feature would come to be a key staple in their core titles, even in the more recent Half-Life Alex. Of course, such features weren't common leading up to Lost Coast release. Rather, leading up to the seventh console generation, development was still a largely secretive topic, especially regarding Japanese developers, but Western studios were beginning to open up. Some even went as far as releasing multiple early iterations of Doom. Years prior, such knowledge often asked seeking out audio-only or magazine interviews, possibly even attending events states over, but the internet, like Lost Coast, brought that insight and history into the player's own home. With such ease of access to modern development knowledge, it's perhaps no wonder that games from such an earlier era remain so captivating to fans. Without proper resources, those mysteries remain unanswered. Game trailers can only tell so much about a game's development process. While it's nice to know when what we're shown is a mere proof of concept or a playable made specifically for an event, most times it's up to viewers to recognize when what they're shown is an actual playable game or merely highly scripted gameplay. Even then, we still expect some grain of truth in what's been seen. Call it an easily exploitable facet of people, but rarely do we realize when we're being lied to, let alone how big that lie is. If you played Halo Wars after being sold on its E3 2007 reveal, it's hard to call that initial trailer representative of the final product. Featuring freestanding bases, warthogs jumping over chasms other units couldn't, and infantry being seen training or performing maintenance for a bit more personality, it's an absorbing presentation, one that the team worked hard to represent in a game that couldn't. At that point in development, the game's AI was in such a dismal state that they made unique code used only for the trailer to represent it as functioning. But many of the design concepts it introduced weren't finalized either. Unit sizes, button mapping, the complexity of base building, and the ways in which the game's economy functioned were still matters up for debate. Players weren't even able to select all units, they were instead capped at 8. It wouldn't be until Halo Wars developer Graeme Devine, who initially pitched the project to Bungie, would step back to focus solely on the writing that fellow developer Dave Pottinger, who worked as the lead designer on Age of Empires 3, would overhaul the game in such a drastic way that he would throw out nearly all of Divine's work, giving us the Halo Wars we know today. But Halo's no stranger to fakery. Halo 2's reveal demo is well regarded as broken when outside certain bounds, but the mechanics and what you could do were true to the experience. But that does raise the question of what else might be fake? With a game as influential as Ocarina of Time, it was inevitable that people would obsess on uncovering its Zelda 64 beta. Yet when part of that came, its beta offered an odd picture in doors only functioning within dungeons and never in the houses seen within early footage or stills, even within an early Kakariko village. Instead, houses seemingly act as landmarks for more developed buildings made later on, suggesting that even in its earliest material they were always meant to be temporary, perhaps in part due to redesigns necessary due to the 64DD's failure, but questioning in what degree was meant to only ever be seen or played. When Dodongo's cavern in the Water 
Temple and nearly every other leaked beta dungeon's textures and layouts resemble their final counterpart rather than the rigid formations reminiscent of earlier games, is it possible most of 64 itself was just a showcase of tested gameplay systems rather than the intended presentation and levels? Mario 64's initial focus was Mario's controls, not the levels, and Pokemon's public betas too featured multiple placeholders and early location designs, so it's not out of the question. Let's not forget, Dodongo's cavern's existence extends to its earliest builds while other early environments had some connectivity to its final world, making 64 look less like the radically different games fans speculate it to be and more the unrefined iteration of what was always planned, Ocarina of Time. It's less magical, but sometimes that's reality. That reality is in part of what made Halo Wars reveal so interesting to me, not the promises it offered, but the circumstances leading to and following such promises. While a 64 playable leak would be a major win for archiving, would wider fans be satisfied, and is there any guarantee fans would understand why it would be changed? Or is it possible that no fully playable build exists, instead being a mere amalgamation of scenes existing largely independent of one another? Try as they might in their efforts to restore or reimagine 64 or its Ur expansion, without the actual story behind their source of fascination's development, they're unlikely to satisfy themselves or fans, leading back into that cycle of endless speculation. Yet such fan games themselves are symbolic of how deep that hole runs against reality. Without answers from developers themselves, it's easy to let the mind run wild with misconceptions, perhaps I've even made a few. Fans long speculated a squared crevice in Zora's domain once led to the Unicorn Fountain, but new data suggests it as the original entrance, complete with a linking room and Ura Zelda's own surface maps also show it as having merged with Zelda Gaiden to ultimately become Majora's Mask. Though it's not as if any noteworthy fan games aim to integrate such elements in ways speculation suggested, with elements containing less creative possibilities generally being ignored lest they become a bloated mess with permanent footprints and cut trees. Perhaps in a more ironic twist, such projects' repeated failures to manifest among conflict within their developers speaks to the realities of development that led towards shifting visions and cancellations of the projects they themselves aim to revive. Zess Ura Zelda being an easy example in its crumbling under the pressure of turning Restoration Project into full-scale fan game while subject to its own internal conflicts and deceit. Reality is as much a part of development's greater narrative. Had Zelda never moved past 64 or had its Ura expansion been realized, where might the industry be and would Ocarina's legacy be altered? Would the games inspired by Ocarina cease to exist entirely or change shape, possibly being the ones to pioneer Ocarina's conventions and Dead by pulling from similar, if not the same, inspirations. If a developer's wife can change just one thing by suggestion alone, there's myriads of possibilities to be had, and that's the thing about betas that makes them so fascinating. They're an inclination of the development stories they themselves can never hope to tell, ones of the people who made them and what led them to make them the way it is. In that way, Halo Wars is more than Ensemble's last game. Once it was previously an original IP Microsoft forced into the Halo mold, that act alone created created a rift with Bungie and Microsoft, one the former would perceive as the whoring out of their child and part of why the studio would seek its independent from Microsoft, which ultimately led them to Destiny and Activision. Despite Divine being a charismatic individual with great appreciation for Halo due to Bungie's then creative control over the IP, it wasn't uncommon for them to leave him without aid when seeking approval for what could be done with wars. But unknown, or at least unapproved by Microsoft, Ensemble had been developing an MMO that they'd refit to match the Halo brand in hopes to see it finished. Seen as a misuse of the funds for the Halo Wars project, Microsoft would shut down that project amidst desires to create another Age of Empires and other prototypes. Then, with what can be assumed to be the resulted damaged trust in the studio dropped an unfortunate future for them. Halo Wars would be their last game, and come completion the studio would be shut down. Many left in that instant, and others have since gone on to work at or found new studios, even those with Microsoft, but those that remained worked tirelessly to create a game they felt would act as a legacy for the studio. The game spawned its own sequel and you can still hear and see people playing it with fond memories even today. Who knows what other games are the result of such turmoil, and who knows where the industry might be with or without them. 